Hi, my name is Jason Mears and I'm going to talk to you about the VMware Cloud or the Software Defined Hybrid Cloud. So I'm going to run you through uh, some of our existing offerings, how they play into the Mega Cloud and Public Cloud offerings. Um, the one caveat I would make about this is that things in the cloud world change on a week by week basis. So some of the information here may change over time. There may be new products and services released on, on a weekly or a monthly basis. And I would say that this is probably the uh, the content that you need to keep on top of more than anything else, just due to just due to the rate of change. So we're going to walk through very gently and very slowly on uh, the, the key concepts of VMware um, Cloud and the VMware Software Defined Hybrid Cloud. One of the things I'm going to talk about because I think it's a, a, a an overlooked um, part of this for most people is. Um, the the need to re-architect applications depending on which cloud provider you choose. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this. And what I will also have is towards the end of the slide deck, uh, there is a slide which is based on my own personal opinion rather than any particular fact or particular you know VMware stance on this. So again, I just want to call out that the last slide is purely my opinion on this, not official VMware policy or facts and figures, just a kind of a, a, a gauge on what I experience when talking to customers. So, um, VMware uh, Hybrid Cloud. Um, we started off with uh, vCloud Air, um, and vCloud Air has, has matured and moved on to be um, a, a wide range and an ecosystem of partners. So there's now roughly four and a half thousand VMware cloud providers who all operate their own cloud services, but based on a core VMware uh, platform. So. You can think of that as being Cloud Foundation, the V, the vSphere hypervisor for software defined compute, software defined storage, and software defined network to give you this ability to move things from the, to and from data centers. And if you watch any of my earlier videos, you'll see on the SDDC overview or um, uh, SDDC key concepts and key components, you'll see a little bit more discussion about moving things backwards and forwards. But essentially, the VMware Cloud Provider Network is four and a half thousand individual organizations that are running the VMware um, set of components to provide you with a VMware cloud. Some are better known than others, so you may have heard of OVH, uh, which is what vCloud Air became. You may have heard of um, Amazon or AMC on Amazon, which is Amazon running VMware components in addition to the um, original Amazon cloud. So when we talk about VMware cloud, there's traditionally three um, use cases that we talk about more than anything. The first one is uh, data center extension. The ability to take on some VMware cloud provider um, um, resources and extend your data center into that cloud environment as if it was the same as putting more resources in your existing data center. So the way that that's done is you will you will buy or you will lease or rent uh, space and capacity from a VMware cloud provider and we will join it to your network using um, a, what, what is essentially behind the scenes, a hybrid cloud connector which is a, a minimal version of NSX which is able to bridge the two networks and make them operate as one. Um, another thing that you can do is not extend your data center, but it's consolidate it. It's to reduce the amount of data centers you've got or move some of your things in a physical data center that you own to a cloud provider. So I quite often see this with some of my customers where the second data center, which is wholly owned by them, they end up moving it to a cloud provider. So they they wholly manage and wholly own data center one, but data center two gets shut down and moved to a cloud provider. The other thing that you also see is um, cloud provider for disaster recovery, um, where we replicate data from the primary data center to a cloud provider, and only in the event that um, an outage is experienced or there's a problem with the primary data center, do we fail over to the, the, the secondary one which is hosted in the cloud. I almost feel that we should have another one up here, which is our fourth use case, which is for us to try and test the cloud and just play with it and get used to it. So it's not an official use case, um, but that's what I see the most interesting with my customers because everybody's got a cloud strategy, but nobody's ever done it before. So everybody's starting from scratch with this and actually a little safe area to play um, is, is quite a good idea for some customers. So we'll talk about the disaster recovery part. Essentially what you would do 
is from your own data center you would replicate your virtual machines into a VMware cloud provider for disaster recovery um, this is replicated at a storage level and you have a small amount of CPU and RAM available to you but essentially you're just rep you're replicating your live environment to some storage here and only when you actually need the compute the CPU and RAM does it get turned on and powered up so it's, it's quite a cost effective way of doing it it's more effective than having a complete active active data center where you're paying for everything even if you're not using it here so um, that, that's one of the common use cases um, next one we'll talk about is data center extension so this is where you can add some compute capacity to your network as if it was actually in your data center on your network but really it's provided by a cloud provider so if you have seasonal or bursty work or if you need to do maintenance or downtime or anything else and you just need to temporarily move workloads this is a this is um, an environment or an area that you can burst workloads into and then expand it as required and contract it back again uh, when you don't need it so again uh, you know an option here is extending you are adding some more capacity as and when you need it um, another option here is data center replacement which is consolidating you're actually moving something from a from maybe data center to permanently to a cloud provider so you go from owning and operating and maintaining and, and doing all the housekeeping on a data center to moving it into the cloud and paying rent on your um, hosted data center here or your cloud data center it, uh, but, but you're able to shut down or close or not renew or refresh your existing you know, physical one before that. So again, this is more of a consolidate type story. So they are the official use cases, but I think in some ways it kind of misses the point. The, um, the, the biggest problem for most people is that they'll say something like, we've gone to Office 365, we've gone to um, SharePoint and Managed Exchange, now we're gonna move all of our applications into Azure. And they assume that because they've done email and SharePoint as a managed service, they can just take any application that they've got now and dump it straight into Azure or um, or dump it straight into AWS, the original um, you know, um, native version of AWS, not the new version of AWS which uses vSphere components. So um, the, these are the small, subtle, but actually quite important things that you need to be talking to customers about because you might find that that simple, we're just gonna move everything to AWS or we're just gonna move it to Azure or we're just gonna move it to Google, won't actually work and you need to do a complete rethink of what this strategy is. So you've probably seen this from our previous videos, but we've got this concept of a VMware data center and software defined infrastructure and everything that goes with it. And you've probably seen, I talked about a hybrid cloud provider and the ability to move things backwards and forwards. So I can take my virtual machines here and my applications and services, and I can move them to a VMware cloud provider with no modification whatsoever. I can move them live and they'll just carry on working, or I could shut them down, move them and turn them on, and again, they'll carry on working. So it's quite a straightforward, simple architecture. But essentially what we've got is the same software at the cloud provider as you have in your data center. You've just decided not to pay for the building, the physical building security, the power, the cooling, the hardware. You're just buying the service, you know, the, the ability to use those uh, vSphere components from the cloud provider. You're just paying for the things that you want, not all the other stuff that comes with it. So that's kind of how VMware do it. You, you're able to move applications and services natively, you know, just, just move them from one place to another and they carry on working. That's the bit there where you can, you know, it kind of looks like it's one network. It's just stretched across two places, but in a way that works well. And the reason we can do that is because we've got things like vMotion and HA. So vMotion is the ability, I bet I'll, I'll just explain this first, that's one vSphere host running VMs, so that's the host there, and it's got its own storage there. We've got another host here with VMs running on it and storage at the bottom. We've got another host here with VMs and storage, and another host here with VMs and storage. Now what they've done here is they've taken all that storage and turned it into a vSAN data store. So now all of those virtual machines are actually sat on a common data store which can be seen by all of these vSphere hosts at the top. So that, that's the way that we've been doing things for 15, maybe 20 years. Why is that important? Well, it, it's a relatively straightforward concept, but it's so important when it comes to moving to the cloud. 
So if we say, for example, that this hypervisor or this vSphere host fails and crashes, we're going to lose those virtual machines. But that VM is going to get started on that one. And that VM is going to get started on that one. We have high availability. It's not bulletproof availability. There is a temporary crash. But we will restart those virtual machines on another host and we'll get them back up again in a matter of minutes or seconds. So that's how high availability works in the vSphere environment. No need to modify applications. And no surprise, that's how it works in a VMware cloud environment because it's using the same hypervisor and same components. So just to stress this point again, we can do high availability without you having to re-architect your application because the hypervisor is capable of doing high availability, which means your application doesn't need to. So I'll explain why that's important. So just as an example, if I give you the concept of Azure and availability sets, you have different zones or regions or availability sets. So this might be a data center in one uh, region or part of the country, and then you have another one and another one. So what you're able to do is run your environment in multiple different places in the hope that no one country, region or data center will crash at the same time. So you've got enough stuff to make this work in a fault tolerant resilient way, but it's down to you to figure out, to, down to you and your application to figure out which copy is running where, whether it's alive, whether it's crashed, whether it's failed, and to handle all of the failover. Now, most applications used in IT environments or legacy applications used in IT environments have never been designed to run in a cloud environment. So the concept of them keeping track of all the available copies, knowing which one is the lead one or the, the main one, keeping them all in sync and then being able to do failover is not something that's been built into the majority of applications. So, um, you know, for, for, for most things that people have, they just assume that they move it to the cloud and it gets highly available. Well, it can become highly available, but only if you um, only if you rewrite the application to make it cloud aware. Um, another example of that I'll, I'll show you here. So this is this is the official um, Microsoft best practice or architecture for designing applications for the cloud. So what it basically says here is one of the regions is a fault domain, and the other region is a fault domain. So if you have something that traditionally just would have been a SQL database server and an IIS web server and you just hold those two machines on a on a vSphere host um, if they failed they would automatically just start again on another host but in uh, mega cloud or public cloud as, like Azure or native AWS for example that doesn't happen you need to re-architect your application so you've got two copies of your web server running in two different places, two copies of your database server running in different places, and they need to be able to communicate with each other and tell, replicate data between each other and tell each other whether they're working or whether they failed. They also need a mechanism to know when a failure has occurred and promote somebody to be the, you know, the, the live one rather than the backup one. If I stretch that a little bit further, Microsoft's actual recommendation for this kind of stuff in Azure is that you should probably expect to run across three different regions and you should be running three copies of everything that's important um, so that there's no one thing can take it down. Now if I just go back a slide, once you've got things running in three different regions, I'll talk about what you have to do to your application, how you have to re-engineer or re-architect your application in order to do this. So if I go back a slide, Sorry, that was forward. If I go back a slide, this is what you have to do to put your applications in Azure if you want them to be highly available. You need to re-engineer for multiple regions or availability sets. In simple terms, that means you need to rewrite your applications. Now, if you're going to rewrite your applications, you, there's a couple of things that you're going to need. You're going to need the source code, um, the actual programming language that created the application. Now for most people they don't have the source code because they've uh, licensed the, the software from another um, organization. You then need a programmer or a developer that understands that application in order to rewrite it. The next thing that you need is permission from the original author of the application to do this re-engineering. So we need 
copies of all the programming language and the source code, we need staff that can understand it and rewrite it, and we need written permission from the person who wrote the application to allow us to rewrite it. But fourthly, and probably most important is, you need the appetite and, and the, the risk appetite for running a modified application in production um, that you've modified yourself um, using programmers that weren't the original programmers that wrote it. So for most people, having the source code, having developers, having permission, and then accepting the risk of running a highly modified application without any you know, kind of real testing by the people who wrote it is one of the biggest problems. Um, even if you can do that, what Microsoft say you need is you need to incorporate asynchronous communication and durable queues. I can hardly say it, never mind do it. But this is putting some rewriting or adding some intelligence into the application so that every copy of the application can talk to another copy running in a different uh, part of the environment. And the durable queues just means that if data has been sent when a failure happens, that you've got a mechanism for making sure um, you don't lose any information during that. You then need to incorporate fault detection and retry logic. So each of these multiple copies of the same application now need to be able to test the other copies to see if they're alive or they're broken. They need to be able to figure out how many times they retry talking to the other one before they give up and then how you decide which of those applications is going to become the lead application because the other one's dead or failed. So these are all the things that you need to do. So for most people that is far too much trouble and too difficult to do. So the thought of just moving your applications into Azure or AWS or Google Cloud Platform and them being highly available it tends to be quite a shock to most customers because they've just been led to believe that not only is the cloud highly available and fault tolerant but it's more highly available and more fault tolerant. Um, but what they fail to consider is the fact that you have to rewrite your applications for this different kind of high availability. So essentially what we're saying is in a vSphere environment the hypervisor does the high availability so you don't have to modify the application. In a public cloud or a true public cloud environment, the application has to do the high availability, not the hypervisor, so therefore you need to rewrite your applications. And for some people, their applications might be 10, 15, 20 years old and the companies that wrote them might not even exist anymore. So this tends to be quite a shock for lots of my customers. So I'll move on to the next one. So AWS. This is AWS, the original version of AWS, not the VMware flavoured version. So this is, if you want to call it AWS native, AWS original, or AMI, some people call this. Um, but this is the um, Amazon Web Services that most people have known for the last you know, 10, 15 years or so. It works exactly the same way as um, Azure does. You have availability zones and regions. Again, nothing wrong with that. It's just that your application has to be written to specifically take advantage of these zones or reasons. So it's highly available, but only if you create or rewrite your application to take advantage of these multiple reason, re, um, regions. But most applications built in the last 10, 20, 30 years have not got that kind of capability built in. They weren't designed for the public cloud. Now, that's quite a shame because there's, there's a lot of great services come with Amazon Web Services and I always used to find it quite annoying that I could either build stuff on vSphere or I could build it on Amazon Web Services and I always wish that I could have built something on vSphere but connect it directly to these things here. Now one thing changed um, last year and this year which is there's now a new offering um, for Amazon which is uh, VMware on AWS. So VMware Cloud Foundation or VMC on AWS. So it's still servers and hardware and equipment provided by Amazon, but the software that they're running on top is VMware software. It's our software defined data center, software defined compute, storage and networking. So this behaves exactly the same as your existing vSphere environment. So if you wanted to put your existing applications into AWS, as long as you do it on the VMware flavored version of AWS, you won't have to rewrite your applications to get high availability because the hypervisor has high availability built in. So what we're really saying is it's just like another data center you already own um, that runs the same software. It's just the AWS pay for the building, the physical security, the power, the cooling, and all the hardware that goes with it. So that makes it quite interesting because if you go back to our 
thing we talked about before, which was our on-premise solution and VMware Cloud Foundation on vCloud or a VMware Cloud provider. We've now got this additional option, which is we can run Cloud Foundation, but now on AWS. So if I was to move that box up there and say, actually, you can run it here, here, or here, I've now got some flexibility where I can start putting VMware workloads onto AWS on the VMware version or the, the VMC version of AWS. So if I've got all these things like um, cost control and comparisons, things like VRealize Business, I can make a decision whether it's more cost effective to run it here, here, or here. And because I've got this common network um, between them all, you know, provided by uh, NSX underneath, I can actually move things between data centers without having to reconfigure anything and I get to use a mega cloud provider like AWS and to go back to my earlier point AWS have got some great features you know CloudFront content delivery network Route 53 global DNS and load balancing um, you know the global load balancing itself is you know the, the world's best or the most the world's most comprehensive load balancer is actually Amazon itself um, if you use Amazon for load balancing, you have a, a truly global, worldwide load balancer. And if Amazon decide next week that they're going to create Fantastic Service X, whatever that service might be, again, um, you can you can leverage that and use that because any of your VMware components stored on VMware Cloud on AWS have access to all of the AWS services on top. Um, I think what we might see is a combination of all of this where we might have the database servers and app servers run at this bottom layer we might have the web servers or even the app servers running up here and then we might have all the AWS services sat on top so the web servers are out at the front of the internet as close as possible to the internet using all these services but the back end stuff is still run on VMware or vSphere on the customer site or a, a, a cloud provider so I think we might get the best of both worlds here so that's kind of, I, I know I've kind of gone over this point quite a lot, but I think it's quite important. So this is what I tend to do with my customers uh, when, I'm, when I'm in a meeting with them. I ask them, based on what I've told you, let me ask you a couple of questions. So this is the point where I mentioned at the start of this video that, that this is my own personal opinion. It's based on gut feeling. I can't say that this is fact or an official VMware policy, but this is something I tend to talk to my customers about. And I say, if you've seen this ability to run um, applications in multiple data centers or VMware Cloud where the hypervisor's got the high availability or you've got the traditional uh, mega cloud or public cloud where you have availability zones and you have to rewrite your applications to get high availability here how many of your existing applications do you think will work well in the VMware type solution and how many do you think you could put straight into AWS or Azure so this is the bit I work through with them and say, you know, kind of, if you think about what you've got now, how practical is it to move them straight into AWS natively or Azure natively without a rewrite? And most of my customers will say 80 to 90% of their applications will only work in their existing environment now that they know about the rewrite process. Uh, and obviously the other side of that is that, um, you know that means that probably only 10 to 20 percent of their applications will fit in there the more people I talk to about this uh, the higher that number gets where some customers have actually said that's probably closer to a hundred percent we will probably only use this for brand new applications but I'm glad I found out because our cloud strategy just assumes we could have moved stuff straight in and it just works straight away so um, some applications will work but not in a highly available manner. If that region or that zone fails, the application and the service dies with it and you have to rebuild or recreate that service. So I'm not saying that the applications won't work, I'm saying that the applications won't work in a highly available fashion without a rewrite. That's the thing we talked about before. Access to the source code, access to a developer, permission to modify it and the business having an appetite to run modified code that's not been tested by the original authors um, in a public cloud and just hope that it works if you have a problem. So that's kind of the thing I run through with my customers and they have often asked me kind of so, so what should I run where or what, which things fit better. So again this is my own opinion this is not necessarily industry fact or VMware official stance on it but what I tend to say is traditional apps and legacy apps almost definitely 
if, if there's no ability to rewrite them, you need to keep them on, on VMware on-prem or a VMware cloud provider, any of the 4,500 VMware cloud providers or even AWS version that runs VMware code. I tend to say that net new and cloud native, if it was a brand new application that was cloud native, I'd probably build it directly on Amazon or Amazon Web Services. And if it's a .NET application, that's again a, a net new application, I would probably build it on Azure. And there are some tools and features and things that you get, um, that you only get in Azure for .NET applications, but, it, but again, it has to be a .NET application, it has to be net new. So that's where I would say, if I was trying to be pragmatic about where I would put my applications, I'd probably put them that way. And again, the other thing is, if it's permanent or sensitive, again, probably there. If it's temporary, or temporary there again, that might be another reason to pick one over the other. So again, just to clarify, this one last slide is my own opinion. It's not industry fact. It's not a VMware stance. I just find it's a useful thing to talk to about customers where they play back to you or feedback to you. Actually, none of our stuff would work if we did it that way. So we need to look again at a VMware solution or a, a VMware on a cloud provider or VMware on AWS type solution. So again, I do feel I've labored that point, but I think it's quite important and it will certainly change your conversation with customers. So, I'm Jason Mears, I'm a senior system engineer in the UK, and I'm also a CTO ambassador. Thank you very much for your time.